What's up, guys? This is episode 49 of the Sales Wolves podcast. As you know, I am Tyler Harris, and I am a sales wolf. One thing I can tell you about a sales wolf is they are efficient, and that is why you're seeing this video right now in the car. I am driving from one meeting to the next to make more sales. And so as I am doing that, I wanted to give you guys a quick explanation of what to expect in this episode 49 of the Sales Wolves podcast. We're going to give you a, a recap, kind of a mashup of all of the last 49 episodes all into one so that you can kind of see where we've come from, where we are now, and ultimately where we're headed. So I hope you enjoy this episode. It's a little different one, but I think it'll bring you a lot of value. Talk to you soon. Sales Wolves Podcast. <laughs> I'm Tyler Joseph Harris. <laughs> this and I'm is Joseph, Joseph Caldwell. Caldwell. And we are the Sales Wolves. The original. The original. The OGs. <laughs> the bearded OGs. A sales wolf will do anything it takes to get the sale. Uh, to, to, to meet the goal, to exceed the expectations. That doesn't stop when they've won, that, that stops when they're, there's they nothing stop. left. That's it. <laughs> Tyler's right, that's what we're passionate about. We've had people pour into us, and, 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 and single-handedly is, is, is one of the reasons for our success. And we don't, we, we're tired of the programs, and tired of all the, all, the, all the bullshit that people are asked to buy, and it builds a false hope, and when that doesn't work, man, Sometimes people can't recover from that, mm. and I think that's unforgivable. And so we want to reach we want to reach all of those people. You tried stuff, and you got sold a bill of goods. We want to we want to reach them, help them, right? Yep. And and watch them go beyond. If you're watching this and you make twenty grand, and you think that you literally would have died and gone to heaven to make fifty, then let's take you from twenty to fifty. All right, from where you are now to where you want to be. I promise you when you get there, you'll have to set another goal and we'll be there to help them go beyond that. So we're going to dive right into today's topic, which is fill my funnel. Fill your what? <laughs> you want me to do what? And you know the problem that I see with prospecting and the way people feel about it is they, they see it. They see the phone calls. They see the, mm -hmm. the cold calls. They see the walking in a door. Um, they see the emails. They see that as a necessary evil mm -hmm. right and that's a problem if you see the the 100 phone calls you should be making in a day the 200 phone calls you should be making in a day the 25 to 50 doors you should be walking through in a day if you see that as a necessary evil i'm telling you you're you're destined for failure you really are mm -hmm. it and, and and the whole the whole thing with this is 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 ignite your fire to fall in love with that mm -hmm. i can't tell you when i started uh, I was selling with a, I was selling with a large payroll company, and 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 I literally hated the phone. Hmm. I I hated it, and I refused to do it. It weighed a hundred pounds. A thousand. Yeah. Um, and I felt like I woke up with it sitting on my chest. Right. I, I hated I when I thought I had to, to to make those phone calls, and then when I when I had the thought of of walking in doors of businesses and 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 cold calling. Oh my God. Terrified. Right. And the only thing that got me over that was falling passionately in love with doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I had a manager one time that at the end of the week, I always did well because I had some charisma and I would get people to refer me business and, and I worked the channels that were comfortable, Sure. right? But I never did those phone calls or those cold calls. And I had a manager that brought me in his office one day. He had just started and he said, hey, so tell me about you had a good week, you sold this. I was like, yeah, yeah. And he asked me, he said, he said, so, so show me where you did your 100 phone calls and you, did, you walked in 25 places a day. And I went, what? I, didn't, I mean, I, I got the results, man. I didn't need to do that, right? And he goes, no, no, no. That was, that's part of your job is, what, is, is doing that right now. And I was scared. I was like, no, nah, but did you see how many I sold? You know, I was, because uh, my sure. charisma results. would always get me out of that. I was just showing him the results. I was going, hey, I sold this many. I'm good. And, uh, and he said, no. I told you that this is what was required every day. 
And, uh, and he said, I gotta be honest with you, this is your one mulligan. Hmm. I had never played golf at the time. I didn't know that that was my one do-over. I thought I was like, my God, he's going to give me a disease or something. But, but, uh, but so I had one do-over, and he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, are you scared of the phone? And I was like, scared? I ain't scared of nothing. So another man asked me if I was scared. Mm -hmm. You don't want to admit that. He's scared to walk in the door someplace. He wasn't taunting me. He was asking. I said, I ain't scared of nothing. He said, great. So Monday morning, I'll be here at 7. You be here at 7. We'll do 30 minutes of emailing and get all of our stuff in order, and then you and I are going to hit the road. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. I couldn't breathe the whole weekend. I bet. whole weekend, man. I was terrified. But what happened was we went in, and we started making those. I think he, I think we, we started cold calling first, drove to my territory, started cold calling, cold called till about mid-afternoon, and then we made phone calls until my fingers about bled. <laughs> And it was miserable. He stayed with me all that week, and we did it time and time again. And what happened was I not only overcame my fear, I saw the results. I saw that I could do that, and I could conquer doing that. And, and not only that, but I was winning. You, you said on the first podcast, you know, you, when, you, when you're at a party, you walk into a room, and people are saying, you know, hey, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You know, hey, I'm a lawyer. Oh, that's awesome. I'm a doctor. Hey, that's awesome. Engineer. Hey, I'm a, I'm a salesman. Ugh, God, Ooh. sorry. <laughs> it's almost like they're like, oh, I'm sorry. So are you working on something different? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, oh, tough breaks, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, we all can't win. <laughs> so it was probably three, Come probably getting close to three and a half years ago. I was, I was kind of at that turning point in my life. Um, I had had some failures in sales. Um, I was a financial advisor right out of college and, and was extremely successful doing so. And a long story short, with a crazy occurrence, I, I was terminated from that job uh, and, and lost what, what I thought was gonna be my career for the rest of my life. And that kind of sent me down this spiral of one sales job after another to where I was ultimately scared to go all in. I was scared to really put a full effort into it because I thought it could just get taken away again. And, and that kind of transformed into also not being willing to go all in because I can use that always as an excuse for when I fail. So it's very easy to say, hey, you know, you, you got fired from that job or you didn't, you didn't succeed there. Oh, but I wasn't really trying. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, was, it, was, it, was just, it was the easiest excuse ever. Just don't try out, just don't go all in. Yeah. That way you've got that excuse of, yep. just in your own head, not to other people, just, well, you know, it didn't really work out, but I wasn't, I wasn't really trying. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't really, that wasn't really my full effort. If I would have right. really tried, I would have been fine. I would have crushed, crushed it. it. Yeah. Um, so, finally... Do you think there's other people out there that lie to themselves on a daily basis about I, where they are? I would think I'm not the only one. I, I would have to say that's true. <laughs> I would hope so. So look, I lied to myself for years, yeah. for years, and I played the blame game, right? Mm -hmm. I came from poor, so mm -hmm. I'm doing really good now. I used the, I used where I came from to 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 point to that and go, well, look, you know, I'm better than that, or I'm I'm doing better than my parents mm -hmm. did, and when when that was just an excuse to not actually do excellent. I, I played the blame game in jobs too. When I had jobs, I, got, I think I've gotten fired from every job I've ever had except for the one at the bank. I actually, I actually um, resigned from that job. That's not easy to admit, right? If you're out there and you have a string of failures, let me just tell you the one thing you haven't done that successful people do is you have not looked in the mirror and gone, it's the man in the mirror. Mm -hmm. It's your fault. Everywhere you were in life, three and a half years ago, mm -hmm. and for me, six, seven years ago, I was at the bottom, I was at the bottom. Don't we, at the end of the day, have to look in the mirror, and when you come to the point where you can absolutely look in the mirror and go, hey, it's your fault for everywhere you are in your life, right now, good or bad. Good or bad. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Perseverance is steadfastness, in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success, right? <clears throat> success is elusive. Mm. And there's almost always difficulty, there's almost always delay. But the person who achieves it is the person who keeps showing up, right? 48% of salespeople never follow up with a prospect. Never, ever, 48%. 25% of salespeople make a second contact and stop. 12% of salespeople only make three contacts and stop. Only 10% of salespeople make more than three contacts. 
But this is what's really interesting. 2% of sales are made on the first contact. <laughs> so you have 48% of people never making the, even the first contact. Yep. 25% that make the second, but only 2% are made on the first contact. 3% on the, on the second contact. 5% of sales are made on the third contact. 10% on the fourth contact. But 80% of the sales are made between somewhere in between, between fifth and twelfth. Success ultimately is just hanging on when all others have let go. Yeah, yeah. And so if you think about it, it's, it's literally just a matter of being there. It's yeah. just being present. Showing up. Showing up. When it comes to the follow-up, the first one we want to go through is, is probably one of the most important, and that is you always want to have a clearly defined next step after always. every conversation, after every meeting, if it's an initial meeting, if it's one of your third, fourth, fifth meetings, if it's on your 10th phone call, yeah. that you never end that call or end that meeting without having a clearly defined action item. Okay, so so here's what went, went over today and here is our next step yeah. and put a time stamp on That's that right. next step. Yeah. Because unless you do that, you're gonna walk out of that room, you're gonna hang up that phone and then the next time it comes around to give that person a call you have nothing really to go off of you have nothing you have nothing set in stone it's all about accountability keeping right. both keeping yep. each other accountable right well there's if you look at it like a timeline you're starting here with a prospect or I'm starting here with Tyler mm -hmm. and I want to get Tyler to here right and so on the follow-up if I don't if I don't clearly define my next step in our interaction if mm -hmm. I don't if there's not a call to action yeah. Um, if there's not, if it's not moving you this way, then the next time we talk, where am I? Mm -hmm. I'm at the same place mm -hmm. or further behind. Yeah. Amateurs touch base and check in. Sales wolves have specific reasons to be reaching out. To That's the exactly prospect. right. I can't tell you how many times I answer my phone and somebody says, somebody <laughs> says, Hey, I'm just touching base That's... with you. I'm like, ah, it's, the, oh, what it's are we the touching? biggest tell of a non winner yeah. probably. Yeah. And it's the biggest tell that I answered the wrong phone call. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, if you don't have, if you, the thing is, the, the reason doesn't even have to be earth shattering. It no. doesn't have to be some big, huge deal. It can be as, as, as simple as having some little piece of information. On the last podcast, I believe it was the, uh, last week's podcast, I talked about when I was a financial advisor, and yep. I would literally pick any news piece of information to call them, mm -hmm. but I would call them up and say, hey, Here's why I'm calling. I wouldn't just call and say, hey, Mr. Jones, was just yeah. touching base to see if you're ready for that financial review. You had to have a reason to call. And this is what it sounds like. This is, this is what it'll sound like. Hey, Tyler. Hey. Hey, this is Joseph. Uh, just, uh, just calling to check in. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing okay. You, you see, you already hate me. <laughs> yeah. You already hate my guts. Absolutely. Right? Because I just wasted 30 seconds of your life. Mm -hmm. And we're all busy. And he knows I don't care how he is. He's yeah. not going to ask me how I am. Yeah. It, it, so, so skip the formalities. Be real and do. What, you wrote the line in here. The reason for my call is boom. The and then first call to action. The first or second sentence should contain that phrase. Yep. We're actually going to piss off everybody today, yeah. so that's okay. That's the goal. Yeah, that's okay. So we're going to provide some training today. Uh, this is soul searching today, right? Yep. This is uh, we're going to cover a topic um, balance. Balance, work-life balance. We've heard work that, right, Tyler? Life balance. We hear <laughs> yeah. it all the time. Yeah, hear it all the time. Hear, hear people. What we want today to be is like work-life balance anonymous. Anonymous. So that everyone watching, you can just feel like you're in you're you're in a meeting. You know, we may not have a twelve-step program, but we're going to have a number of different reasons today as to why work-life balance is a complete exactly complete right. fantasy. Complete fantasy. Work and life aren't binary. Balance is dynamic not static and life is much more complex than just being non-work. Non Work-life balance is a fantasy and believing in it is holding us back from true happiness. 100%. Work-life balance is an excuse. That's all it is. It's, it's a crutch. It's something to hide behind. That's right. Uh, and it, and unfortunately it's an excuse that people use for their lack of work ethic, their yep. lack of results, and ultimately their lack of ambition because it's where they want to go, not just right. what they've done, but where they, but what they want to do. 
it's it's used in, as an excuse for that. And the funniest part about that, you only hear people talking about work-life balance that aren't really working. Right. That aren't doing well in their career. Yep. You never you never hear the person that's like, oh, I'm an I I I am just crushing it in sales this month. But I've been a terrible dad. Well, yeah, no, no. It's always the opposite. It's always like I've been a great dad this week. My sales have suffered a little, but I've been a great dad. And they don't they use it as an excuse. So <laughs> so I'm I've I I'm a great whatever it is at home. And we're not telling you to ignore your kids, by the way. Yeah. Um you spent what, the first three months of your daughter's life. Ten weeks them. straight. Yeah. 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 It was incredible. That was awesome. Yeah. Because the previous months yeah. you were working yeah yeah there was no sleep there was no yeah. I mean, you hammered down right mm -hmm. and so you could do what you wanted to do there yeah. but nobody uses that work-life balance like you're saying as an excuse for <laughs> the opposite right they use it so i don't i don't i don't need to work as much because i i need a better i need to work life balance they, they don't they don't say man whew, I've been too good of a dad. <laughs> I need to let. I need I to need, cut it back. I, I, I need, need to rein it back a little. I need to rein back my fatherhood. And sheepers, uh, I need to lay it down at work. Some I haven't more. seen one of my kids cry in at least a month. In at least a month, I, <laughs> somebody's got to cry. We've got to. Man, my marriage, my marriage is far too good. <laughs> I need to actually spend more time at work. No, no. She's getting a little spoiled. She's. A little... <laughs> Talking about Jesus. our lives, we... <laughs> <laughs> procrastination. I, I I want you to take it out of your vocabulary, okay? Um, to me, it's like the word "try." <laughs> um, you got a pen on you? I do. We're gonna do a little example here. Have we done this before? Not on the podcast. No. I don't think <laughs> we have done it before. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler's been in some trainings with me. <laughs> so, it, the word "try" is is probably one of the stupidest words that's ever existed in the history of language. So I want Tyler to try to pick that pin up. Try. I did. Try. No, you didn't I pick the pin up. You didn't pick it up. Uh, didn't pick it up. <laughs> try. He picked it up. He didn't try to pick it up. He picked it up. See, there, in, the, in the immortal words of, of, of Yoda, Yoda. <laughs> do or do not. There is no try. You don't, there's no try. Try doesn't exist. You, you do something or you fail at it. You don't do it, mm -hmm. right? And so procrastination is one of those words that I believe should be, should be bundled up with try and, and burned in a socialist communist sack. My story is one of struggle, victory, and reality. My journey to the authentic, authentic with myself first, which is self-aware, right? If you're not aware of you and your gifts, talents, abilities, and what you're not good at, mm. authentic with my family and friends, if you're real with the people around you, authentic in my work, and once you become authentic in your work, then it's what? Work? Work, mm. work. I wrote work down five times, then relentless, <laughs> relentless, relentless, relentless. I wrote that down four times, and then growth, growth, growth. Growth only comes on the tail end of work, 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 relentless, 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 relentless. And so you know what subjugate means. I wrote the definition down. It subjugate is to bring under complete control, conquer, master, to make submissive, subservient, enslave. A subjugator is one who conquers, who defeats, who enslaves, conqueror, vanquisher, someone who is victorious by force of arms. Okay, there's some definitions so you understand what subjugator means, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a serious, this is serious. Yeah. So why am I the subjugator of change? Here's why. When, when I, I believe that inside the heart of every person is, is the yearning for a fight, a battle, right? Um, and typically what we do is we turn that outward in the form of blame or in the form of fighting for something external. When you turn the battle that beats in the heart of every person into the correct direction, everything changes. And the reason I'm the subjugator of change, that's what, that's, that's gonna be my personal branding, my personal mantle. The reason that I did that is because I turned my battle on personal change, right? I turned everything I had 
and I did a full tilt invasion against personal change until I made personal change my slave. If, if regret by itself does not drive a human being, it's because they haven't just made that realization yet. It's because they haven't um, realized it. Hopefully this podcast reaches everybody. Our goal mm -hmm. is that people would become terrified of regret and committed to change themselves and, and, and be excellent at whatever you're doing, whatever you choose to do. When I looked up to Finding Moments, it was mostly about like these big life-changing things. Right, right. And it started, I started to doubt. I was like, am I just wrong in how I think about this? And, and observe the masses, do the opposite. Yeah, well, it, <laughs> exactly. It became so much more clear that it is that, that people don't understand it in this way. And it makes it so much more important to get this message out there. And so what I want to read is a couple of uh, quick quotes right here. It says, when often talk, uh, we often talk about defining moments that changed our life. We often place too much emphasis on these singular moments of success or failure. These individual moments are rarely isolated events. They almost always emerge from a prolonged series of seemingly unimportant choices that cleared the way for that moment. What matters is rarely the moment itself, but what led up to it and what follows. Awesome. That right there is huge. And then this next one is even bigger. While this emphasis on process may appear to trivialize moments of inspiration and success or ring false to those who do feel that their life course drastically shifted because of a split second decision, it is liberating on a daily basis. Whatever high achievements or evil atrocities you have committed before today. This very moment is within your grasp. This very moment holds a decision for you. You may choose to continue on that path you are on, or you can choose to begin to move in the direction of the sort of inner life you were born to have. You do not, this moment, have the power or strength to be the person you would like to be, but you have the opportunity to begin moving in that direction. This very moment, you can begin to change. And holy crap, that's they talk about liberating, that's fr that's, that is freeing Free. to know that it, that it does not matter what you've done in the past, good or bad. Good or bad. We talk about here, everything that we do as part of a meritocracy in our organization that we're building, everything is built on current credibility. Yep. And so it doesn't matter what you did last quarter, whether you crushed it or whether you, were, you weren't even there. Right. Today is everything. Today you can start heading down a path to where you can absolutely change your entire year today. 93% of communication effectiveness is determined by nonverbal cues. Yeah. So how can you see a nonverbal cue if you're not face to face? Mm -hmm. How can you really communicate somebody unless you're knee to knee, eye to eye across a table or a coffee shop or whatever. whatever, whatever and, it's and it's the it's the little things, but it's the crucial things that are missed. The crucial elements of communication that are missed in those situations because you could be one facial expression away uh, from somebody completely taking something in a different context than the way you meant it. Um, there's so many times that that happens through text. You know, you oh my text gosh. And, and you send one and it's just, she's like a spouse. Like you send a text to your spouse and she's like, oh my gosh, why are you in such a bad mood? I'm like, whoa, whoa I, I didn't mean it like that. Like, yeah, I, I'm not in a bad mood. I'm in a great mood. Yeah, yeah, like with punctuation. Well, yeah, well, you're sleeping on the couch tonight. <laughs> yeah. Punctuation becomes very, very important. Very important. <laughs> An exclamation point. Did you or, eat, uh, comma, grandma, or <laughs> did you eat did grandma? You... Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> there was one with a horse and a guy named Jack. I can't remember. But, oh, um, God. <laughs> And anybody that's done anything significant is very familiar with failure. Absolutely. In, in anything and everything that you do, um, every failure is one step closer to success. That's it. And, and I think I'll start just by saying that, and, I, and I'm very new to parenting, so you've got more experience on this, but I think the best parenting advice in the world that you could give is to tell your kids to fail early and fail often. I think fail we actually talked about that on one of the other podcasts. We actually mentioned it because I was talking about yeah. Lainey. Um, coming to me and telling me she failed a math mm -hmm. quiz yep. and and she was like all sad mm -hmm. and when she told me she failed I was like yes yeah. good job baby and she was so surprised but I I'm, I'm in the middle of teaching my kids and teach, teaching anybody that'll listen mm. if if you're not failing you're not doing anything yeah. you're not attempting anything you're not pressing the envelope at all we're, we're born relentless taught to relent 
Mm -hmm. Right. So so we're born we're born wild and we're taught to be tamed. Yeah. And 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 born bad taught to be good. I know that's kind of controversial, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but but we're we're born willing to try anything. And the only way we learn and we get better is through failure. It, it continues in our education system where, where I, I, I get a bad grade and I'm taught that I'm less mm. because of that bad grade. Sure. You know, my, my, my F or D or C or B, it's not an A, and if it's an A, it's not an A plus, mm. that I failed at something and failure is bad. We're taught failure is bad over and over and over and over. You failed at that. You pulled that off the counter when you were two, you failed, you got disciplined for it. You sure. But we're not taught that that's the only way, the only way to be successful at anything. Fail at something, mm -hmm. try something that's too hard. You know, you hear about those monks and you hear about, you hear about um, other people a long time ago that would beat themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and I've always thought, who, who would do that? Yeah. And until this last year, and, and so what I, what I realized as my life got more comfortable is that, is that I became a comfort seeker. Hmm. Okay, and, and, and what I realized is as I, as I sought comfort, life delivered pain. Hmm. And I went, if that's true, then the opposite must be true. So if I seek pain, I seek discomfort, then life will continue to deliver pleasure. You know, I, I do weird ass things like get in, I dump tubs full of ice <laughs> and I will go and sit in ice and until I just absolutely cannot stand it or until I just become comfortable. And the cold is a great teacher when it comes to the pain. Mm -hmm. And I seek that. Everything else in a day seems easy after that, right? It has been an ongoing seeking of discomfort, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. We put up these barriers, we compartmentalize as men, we do that a lot. Mm -hmm. Women do it too though. Yeah. And, and we section off parts of our life and we, 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 we guard against, you know, relationships that we're going to have the pain. We don't open up. We don't. So seeking the discomfort there is the only way that you're going to have fulfilling relationships. Hmm. I'm Joseph Caldwell. This is Tyler Harris. Tyler Harris. And we have a special guest today, Dr. Rebecca Heiss. Does some incredible things nationwide uh, on the speaking circuit, which that's where I heard. Her and I was super impressed. There's a lot of things with self-awareness and and um, and her research and and stuff on cortisol is incredible. We'll get into all that. So <laughs> cortisol, yeah, cort is this great slash horrible hormone, right? Okay. Especially for sales wolves because you all live on cortisol, right? Mm. Stress is the thing, and I <laughs> when I talk to people yeah. like like the two of you and like your audience, right? Yeah. You're like, no, I thrive on stress. I need stress. <laughs> Yeah, but what you're talking about are those acute spikes. Yeah. You love this. You love going in, having this challenge, mm -hmm. and everybody needs that. And that's part of your court response. Is that like what happens to you before you walk up to speak in front of a group Absolutely. of people? Absolutely, every right. stinking time, right? It gets addictive, doesn't it? It's awesome. Yeah. It is. And that's, actually, by the way, it operates on the same circuit as sugar and drugs Dopamine. and sex and everything yeah. else, right? So you get addicted All of to these which little I spikes, love. right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan. Right, but you, and you want to ride those. You want to, you want to ride those. <laughs> like a roller coaster. Just like, like a, a roller coaster, like a roller coaster, coaster. coaster right? <laughs> It's a circle. I need to these, stop. These lights just got me really out again. <laughs> I just broke out in a full, full uh, on. You Baby want, sweat. like, because we're all excited about that. That, mm -hmm. that turns us on, that gives us that dopamine, and it's yeah. great, right? The problem is, what's happened in modern society, um, and especially with, with people with your positions where you're always turned on, you're always mm -hmm. high, is there's this other level of cortisol we call baseline cortisol, right? Uh -huh. And that's how you generally operate. Gotcha. And if your baseline cortisol is, say, up here, now suddenly those little, or those spikes, you're not getting as much out of. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to ride that whole spike, mm -hmm. but if you're operating here, you're not getting nearly as much of the high in the dopamine. So it's like every time you have a spike, it's not going all the way back. Correct. And here's the problem. So how do you the control that? The baseline level. So cortisol. Cortisol is actually this horrible. It's like oxygen. We all think like oxygen is great. No, it, it actually kills you, right? It's hmm. this weird paradox. Yeah. Cortisol, you need it. And it gives you those highs, and that's great. But it also is a really detrimental molecule. 
So high levels of cortisol, or if you have that higher baseline cort, which is the dangerous stuff, that chronic stress that mm -hmm. probably most of us experience, what that does is it kills brain cells. First of awesome. all, so it lowers your IQ. <laughs> let's, let's start this there. Just got a little bit more important. <laughs> I just became vastly interested. What it does is it lowers this. It's called a. Let me get this right. BDNF. This right. is like the fertilizer for your brain. It helps new cells grow. It keeps. It protects the, the cells that are already there. And what Cort does is it lowers that, and it punches holes through the actual cell walls of your neurons. Wow. So it kills your oh brain gosh. cells, lowers your IQ, and this is like immediate. I am Joseph Caldwell, this is Dave Walton, and we are Sales Wolves. Arr! All right, so ooh, ooh. we got <laughs> The way that I've come along in life is uh, there are those who speak to you, and they speak to the internal. Mm -hmm. And if we can, uh, let me give you an example. I'll take you back to 1965 in October, and I was uh, in one, probably one of the most important football games in my life. I did not realize it at that moment, but it was a crosstown rivalry, first game of the two that ever played. It was halftime, we were tied 6-6. We go into the locker room, and uh, we, we, you know, you always have your rah, 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 we're gonna yeah. go out, and we're gonna go get them, go get them, you know, and yeah. we're fired up and all that kind of stuff. And, and so everybody's leaving, the coach says, hey Walton, hold up, come here. And so when I go back, I go, what's up, coach? And he says, uh, he said, now listen, I know you. you know, you're a senior this year. You play football, you play basketball, you play baseball, you've done a lot of good stuff, a lot of, uh, you know, da 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 awards and that sort of thing. But he said, let me tell you something. Now listen to me. He said, I'm going to tell you something. It don't mean nothing. It means zero. He said, you know what? You know what's going to count, son? I said, golly, coach, wait, what's up, man? He said, nobody will remember nothing you've done except tonight. Did you get that? He said, tonight is what they will remember. Yeah. And they'll remember it the rest of your life. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, I don't know what happened, but something went down in me when he said that. When I came out at halftime, I was like a raging maniac. I had done gone radical. I mean, I mean, I, Lord have mercy. I broke loose on a 64 yard run that beat them 13, 12. Now I say all that to say this, you're in a moment. To me, every day is a moment. That's every what he told me. Every day is like, that's exactly that's what, what he I was said. to say. And so I learned something valuable at that age. That he, Now, my father had already told me these things because he was a champion. Uh, he's, a, he's a Hall of Famer boxer, uh, North and South Carolina. And he had often said these things to me. But when the coach said it on, on that, that night, that night that you're in the mix, yep. and this is... This is when you got to give it all you got. You don't feel like it sometimes, I'll tell you. You really don't. Matter of fact, uh, one of the guys was supposed to be receiving the kickoffs was benched. And, and so he called me and said, you're going to have to receive the kickoffs and the punts. Uh, so I, I got a good pair of hands, so I, I, I'm receiving it. And I, I run up the field and you know, they hit me and take me down. And, and my senior year, and I, I, I'd already been drinking alcohol. I was already involved in a whole lot of stuff I shouldn't have been involved in. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't in the great shape that I should have been. And uh, so I'm huffing and a puffing. And I go back to the hull and I call to play. And dead burn, I turn around and whoever's supposed to get the ball don't show up. Guess what? I'm running. I'm running like a crazy man because they after me. And I, uh, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I run to the sideline, I fake to run out of bounds, and this, this guy that was on me just relaxed. And when he did, bam, I took, took off. off up the sideline. You can't relax, my friend. Nope. There is no time to relax in whatever you do. You, you have to be constantly on guard, guarding everything, giving everything you got, being sensitive, alert, and watching everything that's going on because every time you move and go and do, there are divine appointments, divine connections, people that you're meeting who can actually help you go to that next level. I believe that with all my heart. Oh, that's why I am where I am now. I'm 70 years old. Did you know that the first French fries weren't actually cooked in France? They were cooked in Greece. Good, the good jokes that I have on this page. I actually, I actually, this is, I used to work in a shoe recycling shop. It was soul destroying. Good.
Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I bought some shoes from a drug dealer. You know I love shoes. I bought some shoes I from a drug you love dealer. Shoes. I don't know what he laced them with, but I was tripping all day. Steven Spielberg's over there laughing. One, one point for, one for, point for, for the camera, man. All right, so seriously, I'm not sick. <laughs> that made even no sense why I laughed. Hey, Dad, can you put my shoes on? No, I don't think they'll fit me. <laughs> oh, gosh. Is that close to holding on? Congratulations. I have not gone ahead. What did the janitor say when he jumped out of the closet? Supplies. <laughs> ah! So stop quitting quitting. Wait, start. Start quitting quitting. Or just quit quitting. <laughs> That's the very first thing I said. Start quitting quitting. Quit quitting. Quit. Don't quit. That's the topic of this, <laughs> this episode. Quit quitting. <laughs> So we've got two big pillars here that we want to talk about when it comes to this this concept of quitting quitting because that's really the only thing you need to quit is you just need to quit quitting if you're going to be successful yep. if you want to last success is largely based on just the person that doesn't let go when everyone else has that's right. it's the person that hangs on and endures yeah. um, and so the first one we want to talk about is the fact that you have everything you need i think the biggest thing that we see with salespeople, just with people in general, is they think that they're lacking something, that, that, that they don't have what it takes to do whatever. And so a lot of this has to do with self-awareness, which is a big topic that we always, always discuss on these podcasts. And it's figuring out what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. But the goal in that is you have to stop hating yourself for the things that you don't have, or have and start done. loving yourself for the things that you do. When you go through that journey of creating a heightened level of self-awareness and really discovering who you really, really are, it's not about anything other than celebrating those things that you are. It has nothing to do with focusing on the weaknesses. It has nothing to do with now all of a sudden thinking you have to overcompensate and learn and get better at all these things that you're not good at naturally. Right. It's about going all in and tripling down on the things that you're actually good at 100 well how do i work those that many hours and still be a good dad yeah. you know what i'm saying like you need to break the paradigm in your mind that you can only be gone from nine to five right yeah. everybody thinks i gotta be home at five gotta do dinner with the family then i gotta spend an hour talking to my wife dear god how miserable you know listening to everything in the day and all that stuff and then i've got to try to catch a tv show and go to bed and get up and do it again mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're trying to juggle all day every day so what we did was i didn't have to be there every night i didn't have to be there every morning i literally would sit down with my family and go okay i've got some intensive work to do this may be a week it may be two weeks it may be 30 days it may be 90 days and then at the end of this 90 days this is what i have planned for us as a family this at the end of this week this is what i have planned for us as a family and i'm all in i'm all there i'm a hundred percent focused it's breaking the paradigm in people's yeah. mind and going all in on work and all in on family these special are guests. very special guests. very special guests um, as you probably guessed, this is my son, Jack. I also have three daughters. How old are you, son? Uh, I'm nine. I'm ten. Ten. I keep forgetting that. You just turned <laughs> ten. Yeah. <laughs> you just turned ten like a, two weeks ago. So, um, and then this special <laughs> little lady is... This Arden, is Arden and this is Tyler's new little baby girl. How old is she? Six months. She is ten months. Ten months. Ten months. Ten months. Yeah, ten, ten months we flies just, by. We just got in the invitations for her one year birthday, which is just crazy. Isn't that crazy? It's bizarre. There's two ways to balance a scale. One is taking away, which is the way most people talk about work life yep. balance. If I need to increase in one area, I need to take away from another area. Yep. But if you need to increase in an area, you can also just increase in that area. And there's so many other ways like sleep and like all the different leisurely activities that people do away from their families and away from work that a lot of times they're not willing to decrease Yeah, yeah. in order to increase the family time. Um, but I think that's what's so important. I am Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. Stan Genlin. And we are the Sales Wolves. 
Uh, it's always fun when we can get a guest to howl with us. Yes. <laughs> and one of the things I wanted to mention too about uh, kind of the whole American dream and you know immigrant hustle, one of the defining moments I remember in my life, my grandfather was sick. He had, I think it was prostate cancer in Ukraine still. And there was a surgery at the time that we could have gotten for him if I think it cost like 79 or 89,000, something like that. And we did not have the money to do that. And I remember like, man, I never want to be in this position where someone, life I can save, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I just felt so powerless at that moment. Yeah. And in the Soviet Union back even today, like you get in line and if they don't call your number, you're just dead. There's mm -hmm. no like, well, this guy's really dying. Let's help him like here in the US. So I just remember like feeling so powerless and you know coming home that night i was coming from a club i was all drunk and sure. i come home and my mom's sitting there on the couch crying and man, it was that's when like i realized like what the hell am i doing in my life going out mm -hmm. every weekend and yeah. drinking and like i could be saving this man's life mm -hmm. yeah. so that, and that was it i mean as soon as i got here i called every successful real estate agent in town i met with the mayor i met with everybody at city hall i met with all the top builders and i told them i'm coming to town and this is what's going to happen hmm. like within two months i had a meeting at high cotton which is not there anymore right. i had all the top agents there the mayor all the top builders and i told them what my plan was for greenville and i wanted them to be part of it and most wow. of them laughed at it huh. but you know, here I am today, number one in town, so. So the number one barrier to achieving simplicity, and this is interesting, is, interesting, is it's uh, lack of self-awareness. Hmm. That's the one of the main barriers of simplicity, and it's understanding. <clears throat> so having the courage to eliminate all the unnecessary things that don't add value to you, so that you actually have time to focus on the important things. Oh, yeah. So like in our everyday lives, there's you know so many things going on. And it takes deliberate action to eliminate the things that don't matter. When you fail at things, and especially if you fail repeatedly, there's a difference between failing and being a failure. And, and I think that's what can happen, especially you know, as it pertains to sales and, and, and as it pertains to your professional life. Uh, but that ultimately will carry over into every part of your life. And that when you have failure upon failure, it's so easy to become this person that like I, I, I'm a failure because that's yeah. what I do is I'm failing. And, and that's, I think key is, is getting yourself out of that because you're not, a, you mm -hmm. are not a failure. The season that you're in, you know, you could be just in a, in a bad place in that particular time of your life. But I mean, I would say that if you're still breathing, that your time's not up. My name is Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. And Jay Do. And we are the Sales Wolves. Ow! Ow! <laughs> so I work from home. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, okay. At heart, what I realized, what we probably didn't go to school for, and I know you guys, you hustlers out there and all you other sales wolves who tune into what, what we've got going on here on, on your podcast, we're all educated. We read. we got all sorts of books going on in our life, and sure. we, we have mentors that pour into us. But the school system didn't teach us that. So when I got to the point where I've got a high school and college education of a mass communication degree, I was driving to a Clemson basketball game, and I like to find some of these guys that we all know now but I had no formal training it wasn't mm -hmm. in my life it wasn't in my family's life mm -hmm. and I found a Jim Rohn audio that lasted 30 <laughs> oh, minutes I love Jim yeah. Rohn it lasted 30 minutes so what it was was Jim Rohn's goal setting workshop that I love changed it. my life write down the five things you've accomplished so far in your life that you're most proud of and the five things I wrote down since five years old to 24 hmm. I've gone 5 to 21 22 in school all my time had been spent at school or work up to that point in my life. Mm -hmm. And none of the things that I wrote down as the five things I'd accomplished so far in my life had anything to do with work or school. This is Brent. Hey, Brent, this is Tyler Harrison, Joseph Caldwell, and uh, you are on the Sales Wheels podcast, my friend. So my question was, if you have somebody that you see and you know has you know, this unlimited potential, but they're not tapping into any of it, do you guys think you try to push that individual and motivate that individual to do better, when do you stop? You know, when, when's it appropriate to continue to go? When's it appropriate to kind of pull back on the reins? Or do you really invest time doing it at all? Over the years, I've actually ruined some friends because of what you're talking about here, because I figured out that unasked for advice is a 100% of the time criticism. 
And if you're criticizing someone, they don't like you and they will never listen to you. Even if they like you, they won't listen to you ever. Hey, what's happening? <laughs> hey Jeffrey, we've got we're on the Sales Wolves podcast, and we're just call, we're calling people we're grateful for. And I got to tell you, man, you are one of my favorite people on this earth. And I it's hard for me to express my gratitude for you and to you without crying. But did I ever tell you the story, Tyler? One time that I called Jeff up, and I literally was on rock bottom. And I literally did not have a way to pay him back. And he was probably the only person stupid enough to loan me money. <laughs> Seriously. And and I called him up and I was like, Jeff, I need some money. I didn't need 500 bucks. I needed $10,000. And I said, Jeff, can... He's laughing about it because he knows. <laughs> he goes, how much you need, Josie? A couple thousand? And I was like, I need $10,000. And he said, meet me at BB&T. Wow. Rescued me. This is the, one of the nicest people alive, and I, I just want you to know, Jeff, how thankful I am for you and that we became friends. I mean, some people say they're your friends, and they're really not, and so I am grateful and thankful for you. I am Tyler Harris, Joseph Caldwell, and Sylvania Harad, and we are the Sales Wolves. Ow! Ninety to ninety-five percent of people walking on this earth are not fulfilled in what they're doing. They are not joyful in what they're doing. A low number. Oh, I know. You know, it's, and I kind of rounded it down so it sounded a little bit cooler because I like the number five, you know? But think about that. Like, if, you, if there's a few billion people on this planet, why is one, like, three to five out of every hundred I meet fulfilled? And it doesn't matter about if they're a multi-billionaire or if they have $10 in their pocket because I've been, on both, been with both people and seeing fundamental different things. And so my entire mission that was kind of like my Elon Musk moment was what if I could flip that number upside down? What would it take to be able to do that? To get to a place where people were walking around and they were fulfilled. And I refer to that as enthusiasm, which if we go to the root word of enthusiasm, it's enthos, which means possessed by God. If we want to go even deeper than that, possessed by unconditional love. How much different would people be with parenting, teaching, doctors, lawyers, everybody, if they were truly aligned with a mission that served what they wanted to do in life? That's what I'm working on. I am Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. Coach JC in the house. <laughs> and we are the Sales Wolves. Ow! Yes, yes, yes. You know, but I think there's a lot of people out there right now that, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out, so how do I put the fire out in my life right now? I'm That's down right. and out. I'm desperate. And I'm listening to this podcast. I'm listening to this show, Sales Wolf. Tyler, JC, man, I, I, I tuned in and I don't even know why I tuned in, man. I, I can't close the next deal. Uh, my life's in shambles. And I want to I wanna challenge that individual right now, just what I did, create a new story. So many times we're defined by what we currently are going through, and that's all we could see. And if all we see what's right in front of us, that's all we're going to have. And when I was at that downtime in life, you're talking about the mental state and emotional state, I remember I had to start to tell myself, you got to start to think, you got to start to speak, and you got to start to act like you're already on the other side. Yep. If you don't, yeah. and this is great for sales. I mean, you assume the close before you close. Right? People go, well, Coach JC, I can't close the deal. Like, how did you start a nonprofit and bring together over 60 agencies? It's never been done. My name is Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. And we've got Chris Cavallini as a special guest, and we are the Sales Wolves. Ow. <laughs> you have to do things that make you uncomfortable. You have to do things that are hard. And the, the funny thing is, like, after you do that for a while, it, it's like kind of like a sick, like, gratification. You actually start to enjoy it. It's not like that in the beginning, though, right? You have to nope. develop that habit. But you start to enjoy it. You don't enjoy, like, how cold it feels. You don't enjoy, you enjoy the fact that you, because you know that by doing stuff like that, the, uh, the outcome, what the outcome will be, how, how it benefits so many other areas of your life, makes you a better human being, personally, professionally. You know, the, mind, the mindset is everything. Without the mind, there is, is nothing else. And 
that's a very, very easy way to, to work on your mental toughness. Is, you know, jumping in a freezing cold thing and starting your day off on the highest note. I love it. Like when you give with no expectation, it enriches your life beyond anything. It's, it's almost like it draws more mm -hmm. of the resources to you. I legitimately can look and if somebody has no resources in their life, like I understand going through rough patches yeah. and hitting broke, mm -hmm. okay? But poverty is a disease. It is not a bank account. Broke is your bank account. You hit yeah. rough times, man, you hit rough patches in life, a business collapses, you can be broke. Yeah. Not a problem. But if you choose to stay there long term and it turns into poverty, then that's a disease of the mind and the spirit. Mm -hmm. I believe it's a disease of the soul. But uh, but but when I see that long term, and I know people are going to get really, really frustrated or probably send something mean to me mm -hmm. about this, but when I see that long term, in a in a society or a group of people or a single person, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that's not a giver. My name is Tyler Harris. We've got Daniel Davis, and we are the Sales Wolves. Ow! Yes. Um, and I actually dropped out of, of college to pursue this because it just started to take off. As crazy as it sounds, I decided to leave college because I didn't want to end up broke. But I know you're supposed to go to college <laughs> to not be broke. But I know that sounds so dumb, but I, oh, yeah. I, no, no. I knew it was going to lead me down a path of being not happy and having to pay back big student loans. Um, I gained a lot of it from the school of hard knocks. So having to do with people, t you know, taking uh, money away from me, bad situations, and then realizing, you know what? The one thing I can always do is I can invest in myself. Mm -hmm. I can sit in my mama's garage when I was young and make YouTube videos for days, especially this is the time when you didn't even have th those commercials or click past five seconds. So you mm -hmm. can get all the organic traffic oh, that yeah. you wanted to. Um, even to this day, the greatest thing I could ever do is just bet on myself. <laughs> I am Tyler Harris. My name is Joseph Caldwell. And we've got Casey Adams here today. And we are the Sales Wolves. Ow. <laughs> yes. You hear Casey Howland too? Yes. yes. We're not going to talk about marketing. We're going to talk about psychology and understanding humans. This is something that I've kind of learned about when it comes to marketing is that it's all about psychology. And if you can put out a video that relates to someone through storytelling, through an emotional connection, that will interpret it in such a different way than just trying to make a video viral. But if you can kind of understand the human interaction that your video is going to have with someone, the emotional triggers it's going to pull. And then when I really starting, whether it be you're posting a viral video or my team and I, when we're creating one, how is this going to make someone feel? How are they going to um, interact with it? How is it going to make them, is it going to make them tag someone because they have that emotional connection of love, of interest, of excitement or happiness. We kind of look at the, the key components of what are the first five seconds? Does it make someone instantly happy? Does it make someone instantly nervous? So we kind of like to look at it as the emotional triggers throughout the video and then take those emotional triggers and then try to correlate that to whatever audience we're targeting. I am Tyler Harris. And I'm Joseph Caldwell. And we've got Nehemiah Davis and I'm happy to be here. And we yes. collectively are the sales wolves. Ow. <laughs> My mentor reached out. She said, hey, Nehemiah, I know you like to give back. There's something called the Hoodie Awards I think you should run for. Steve Harvey does an annual award each year called the Hoodie Awards, which stands for Neighborhood Awards. And, they, and the awardees are like cool things in the hood, like best fried chicken, best car wash. My particular award was best community leader. So she said, hey, I think you should run for it. I'm like, yo, why should I do it? I only got a day to do it. I ended up running for the award. I ended up losing, unfortunately. I did become a finalist. They flew me out to Atlanta. Once he got off that stage, I snuck in the back. I hope you've enjoyed the last 48 episodes. This 49th episode was a compilation, and we appreciate you tuning in to the Sales Wolf Podcast. From now on, it's available on iTunes and YouTube, so please subscribe if you've enjoyed anything, if you've gotten anything out of it. And then next week, our 50th episode is none other than Sean Whalen. I cannot wait for you guys to see this one. It's going to be incredible. Thank you.